Hello and welcome to my talk. I'm Stefan Kalkowski. I'm working um, at Genode Labs as a developer since more than 10 years now. And I was uh, focusing on the ARM architecture mainly in the <coughs> last years. <coughs> Sorry. And um, within the last 10 months, we achieved uh, quite a few steps to uh, run Genode on ARMv8 machines, on certain ARMv8 hardware. And today I want to uh, demonstrate this to you. So it's more technical demonstration with the focus on the demonstration, not so much on the technical details. And uh, as you have seen in the previous talk, um, we are used to uh, run our presentations on our own software stack. So the same applies to this talk. And like uh, Norman uh, already told you, uh, with, with, with regard to his uh, setup, it's the same to me. So. It was uh, done uh, a day before I was uh, starting to force them, so cross fingers that everybody, everything will work. So before we come to the uh, actual uh, demonstration uh, where I want to show um, three different aspects uh, that might be interesting for embedded systems, which you could already use right now uh, with Gnode, I want to give you a short introduction on uh, Gnode's history on ARM and what were the findings uh, of us uh, that we uh, made out of these experiences. Then I will showcase you uh, certain aspects, and then we come to a short uh, roadmap for this year uh, related to the ARM development. So this picture shows in a rough sketch uh, what kind of different ARM hardware was entering the Gnode landscape. And uh, what you can see, I don't want to go, go into much detail, but we had slight uh, different uh, ARM uh, architectures from version 4 until now version 8. And we collected a lot of experiences also with different SOC vendors like uh, Broadcom, the series uh, that were used in the Raspberry Pis, um, the OMAP uh, 4 from Texas Instruments, an incarnation of uh, the Panda board, and Exynos 5 from Samsung in incarnation of the Arndale board. And we did not just run a kernel on top of it with some timer driver and UART, but really tried hard to develop uh, different device drivers for the peripherals for it. And um, so we had uh, ZATA, um, SATA um, drivers or SD card or uh, different um, display engine and so on. And the experiences for, from this kind of development was that it's a pain and that it's really painful if you are just a small operating system, open source operating system uh, with no access to uh, documentation at all. And um, so the best reference you might get is uh, Linux uh, kernel drivers written by the SOC vendors themselves. So there's not so much semantics uh, that you can read out of it. Um, and in the worst case, you've got even uh, blob drivers, which are just uh, loaded by the Linux kernel drivers inside, so like HDMI blobs and uh, whatever. So <coughs> the situation is not that good, but um, the best experiences we made so far uh, where with uh, NXP-based, uh, the iMix um, series um, on, and their system on chips. So I would not say it's, uh, it's great and everything is fine with NXP uh, and I don't want to make marketing now for them, but uh, from our experiences, it was uh, best with regard to open documentation. And we used it, for instance, for our uh, extensive studies with uh, using TrustZone, with uh, doing secure boot on this kind of platforms and also, um, yeah, we made some good experiences here. So this is what I wanted to give you uh, as a result of, um, of this kind of history. And we are not the only ones, obviously, that um, seem to recognize uh, that NXP makes uh, better docu documentation. So there are several open hardware um, projects um, right now that use uh, this kind of systems on chip. 
So here you see uh, the USB Armory, uh, which now has already a second um, uh, version of it, uh, which was presented, I think, at CCC Congress of th this year or last year. And it's a kind of a smart card system uh, where you can store your uh, cryptographic material, which you can use f for signing stuff or just uh, storing encrypted uh, stuff. And it's running on an NXP IMX5, and it's completely open, so you can download the layouts and you can assemble it yourself if you like. And uh, we also had a Gnode port on the first version. So, yeah, I'm looking forward for the second one. And there is this MNT Reform. It's a very cool uh, self-made uh, laptop project by MNT Research, and it's really somehow a one-person project. I mean, th there are more than one person, but from the technical side, it's, more, uh, it, it's no, not more than one person. <laughs> and again, you get all the material. You can just download it. You can build it yourself, um, including a nice mechanical keyboard. And um, I'm really looking forward to bring uh, the Sculpt OS, which you uh, just had a look at if you attended the previous talk. Uh, to this kind of uh, device. And we have this Librem 5 um, smartphone, uh, which uses the same system on chip like uh, the MNT Reform. And this is the IMX 8M. Uh, so it's an ARM V8 uh, NXP uh, system on chip. And again, uh, what they try to achieve is giving back control to the user uh, getting a smartphone which is mostly blob-free block as far as they can get with it. And, um, yeah, I think we have this mindset in common with those kind of projects, and this is uh, somewhere uh, where we like to meet, and we also like to take this Lightroom 5 uh, to make an Android-like uh, environment, an Android runtime replacement, so to say, in those of you who attended the talk from Alexander Zinier about uh, their component uh, framework um, know what I mean. Okay, so <clears throat> this board, for those of you who are not sitting in the first line, is uh, staying here in front of me uh, on the table, and I have the presentation now uh, on this device. So it's uh, the same system on chip like in the Librem 5 and in the MNT Reform. And um, you see we have some Ethernet connector, USB connector, um, uh, HDMI connector, and uh, SD card. And we have peripheral drivers running right now in the system that drive all those kind of devices. And yeah, but this is not everything. Um, but to show you this and not just uh, list items, I uh, like to come to the actual demonstration part. So um, what are the use cases for Gino used in, in the embedded world? So just imagine you stand in front of the ticket machine and the ticket is showing you blue screen. Or you drive in peptic transport and it doesn't show up the next station but some weird other desktop or whatever. And, of course, uh, the ATM doesn't give you cash because it's want to do a Windows upgrade right now and doesn't work out until it gets this. So those are not uh, some hypothetical uh, examples, but I think all of you somehow experienced already something like this. And here you see the WannaCry attack at Deutsche Bahn where they we're out of order for several hours or even days. I'm not sure anymore. So um, what you actually need is not a fully fledged um, uh, desktop operating system like Microsoft for a kiosk system, but you need a custom tailored uh, solution. And of course, the costs for uh, those who develop such systems are standing in the way when, if you have to do this all on your own. Um, but those of you who attended the previous talk have seen how easily it is to integrate a custom-tailored custom uh, environment. But, of course, you need some um, support in form of uh, components for this. And uh, what you see here right now is, uh, again, the slide central thing, this administration console. 
And uh, I want to show you uh, now that in this system, there are already on the small ARM machine, which only uses the first CPU, because I didn't wrote a load balancer, uh, which automatically uh, drives the components on different CPUs and uh, did not manually tweak it. So everything is running on the first CPU. And we have already 76 components running in this uh, system. And as you can see, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's all, all everything is software rendered, so it's uh, really uh, usable as as a display system, as a display panel, or as, as a kiosk system. Now we have very easy um, widget set, a very simple one. And maybe uh, your programmers are not uh, coming to this kind of widget set or programming in a GNOME environment. But of course, we can also start something else. So let's start this Qt5 text editor. I mean, of course, this takes some time because. Uh, everything is read from a non-optimized SD card. You can see all uh, which is now doing is uh, some I.O. And he's, it's heavily uh, copying over the, the bytes from, from the SD card. But um, in the end, crossing fingers, we will see <laughs> this text editor you already know from uh, the Sculpt version on x86. So. What I wanted to show you, we did not just ported some peripheral drivers, but we really went through the whole software stack. So we have different libraries like libpng and Qt5, uh, Qt5 and uh, TCP IP stack, of course the libc itself, and uh, the base library of GNOME, uh, obviously. And we went to the whole software stack to make this um, uh, happen within the 10 months. So I'm quite convinced that we will also achieve more with regard to the hardware targets I already mentioned. Okay, but let's come back to the slides. <clears throat> um, another example. So uh, today everybody uh, talks about IoT and all those crappy devices uh, that are um, out there and um, Partly the idea is to have some uh, shield gateways to, to uh, as edge devices, uh, which are um, then, um, yeah, be better shield uh, those kind of uh, IoT devices. And uh, this is such a device. But of course, you um, always have the problem of uh, firmware upgrades in such environments. And um, as you have seen, we have this depot packaging uh, mechanism. And I can show you, ah, sorry, wrong key. I can show you, um, maybe you didn't notice, but I have a vulnerability in my backdrop uh, application and somebody defaced my wallpaper. So um, an upgrade routine that regularly um, gets information about uh, new packages might get now the information about a fixed version. And now I will be the uh, upgrade routine because it's not there yet, but I just do it by hand. So first I take away this Qt5, it's in the way, and I open up a new component. Oh, no. Okay, now exactly this happened, what, uh, what shouldn't happen. Um, so I have to reboot. I think the Sculpt Manager is not, uh, not available yet. Yeah, sorry. But that can happen. <laughs> what exactly happened? Sorry? What exactly happened? Uh, there's some, there's some um, I, I think the Sculpt Manager, which is this uh, graphical user interface for administration, missed some uh, signal or got Maybe it, it had to do a resource request or whatever. I cannot show you now because I do not have uh, some uh, report, uh, some, some log output here to, to look at it. So yeah, as I mentioned, it's, it was ready the day before, so. Okay, uh, sorry for this, but we continue, just, just go ahead. 
Okay. So I reuse uh, the image from the SD card. Um, <laughs> Okay, so here we are again. And to fix the um, broken backdrop package, I now first copy over this uh, deploy configuration, which uh, contains all the packages are, which are now uh, running in this runtime. And I copy it over to uh, a non-automatically uh, managed space. So in the uh, normal config, uh, no, I mistyped, sorry. <clears throat> okay, so now uh, it's known that, that we want to hand something manually and don't want uh, the system to manage it automatically anymore. So I go over and, and oh, here you see this sticks blue black backdrop, which is the package containing the bug. So I just know as the upgrade routine that there's a minus A version of it, and I just uh, save the file. And what you see now is, uh, yeah, it throws away uh, the original version. It's downloading the new version, verifies it, ex extracts it, and uh, replaces uh, the running stuff. And if you somehow um, yeah, see that there are problems with it, maybe with a watchdog mechanism. Uh, the component is not coming up again. Yeah, we can just revert it, of course. So, sorry? Is the logo fixed? Is the logo fixed? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it was fixed. <laughs> sorry, sorry, yeah, of course. So, I show it again. Zack, okay. Now it does not have to download, of course. So it's fixed. Okay. So last example, I have to hurry up because we are already running out of time. Okay. Last example. Oops. Um, legacy software in uh, industrial contexts. So often you have. Uh, some <coughs> custom software which uh, costs uh, a lot of uh, money, which uh, a lot of manpower was uh, used to, to uh, do this only for very few instances of, of this uh, running software. And um, they are also tied to a specific operating system version. So they use specific drivers on, on their own and you cannot just uh, replace uh, it with a newer r version of uh, my Microsoft or whatever. So <clears throat> here the problem is uh, they run out of s support. Um, maybe they are also edge devices and uh, you want to give some uh, possibility to run this legacy OS. So what we did is um, we have a virtual machine monitor for ARM V8. So I start a Linux VM. Um, and this Linux, uh, of course, Linux is big. So it's a generic ARM V8 kernel of 18 megabyte or something like this. So it needs some time to uh, be copied again from the SD card. And this uh, was a joint uh, project. It was not, uh, we, we did not finance it on, on our own, but it was a uh, corporate work with uh, Bedrock System, who also sit in this room, and I want to thank it, uh, at this place for uh, supporting us in, in, in doing so, because they do a much more ambitious project of building up a virtual machine monitor uh, that is, gets formally proved, but at that point they were not uh, ready to um, develop it uh, uh, right now in their system, so we rapid prototyped, so to say, in Gnode, and they could use it as a blueprint. And uh, as far as I know, they are ambitious to open source their version two. So we are very uh, looking forward to to use that uh, too. So I just want to show you. Um, this is not just some Linux working, 
but it also has network access uh, via Word I/O, and um, so I can I can start a movie, a network stream movie. Hopefully, if the network is working, yeah, okay. So um, the VMM contains. Uh, um, a, a real complete uh, CPU model. Um, it has models for generic interrupt controller version two and um, and three for the generic timer of ARM, <laughs> and it has uh, drivers for Word I/O console and for Word I/O network. And yeah, I think um, do I have some minutes left? Okay, so this is Star Wars. Uh, Streamed over Telnet. Um, let's come to the roadmap again. So th those are my technical demonstrations. And my last slide is uh, the roadmap for the upcoming year. So um, I definitely want to uh, push this SCALP development on ARMv8 further. So um, SCALP on this MNT reform would be re really cool. But uh, for this to happen, we need some kind of platform driver. So now the drivers are running, but we do not have uh, access to the PCI bus, for instance. We do not have access to the uh, clocking and power management, and uh, we need this kind of stuff in, in incarnation of a platform driver. Um, we want to have more Word IO uh, support so that we can use it interactively, of course then we could really use a Sculpt OS desktop like we know it from the x86 world. And, um, of course, it would be pretty cool to use hardware accelerated graphics. So those are the uh, plans for this year, and now I'm open for questions. Thank you for your attention. Ah, sorry, I forgot to mention, it's our own kernel. So uh, we did not use another one. Ah, sorry, I have to repeat the question, I forgot. So the question was, what kernel did we use? So uh, in the initial development of ARMv8, in the very first release where we uh, brought the first uh, ARMv8 support in, uh, we used Fiasco OC because it already has uh, ARMv8 support. But then uh, we implemented it in our own kernel, and also this whole virtualization support stuff is part of our own kernel. Other questions? Okay, then oh. let's close the session. Thank uh, you. Thanks, Stefan.